spectrum doesn't look like the green spectrum. So in modern stromatolites, we can find heterogeneities of the, the chemical composition of carbon in different mineral mineralogical uh, laminae. Okay, so different types of organic polymers are preserved in the different mineral layers. Some of them, they clearly in the modern stromatolites, they clearly represent cells, while other polymers might represent extracellular polymers that are formed by bacteria. Um, smectite in the modern stromatolites is definitely in a biotic phase, but it is always mixed with organics. And the question, of course, it's an open question, speculative, maybe prov provocative, but are these two type of polymer, of organic polymers that we see in the modern stromatolites, are they the same as the two types of polymers that we see in the ancient stromatolites? Of course, this is an open question and we need much more work to, exam uh, to look at this. So, I'll, I'd like to finish with this short story about modern stromatolites. Um, that's something that we have done very recently. And I'll show you this, this is kind of another approach, how to, to study these modern stromatolites. This is more biological uh, driven, but okay, this is still mineralogy. Um, so we worked on, on some modern stromatolites from Mexico. Nice thing with stromatolites, that you find them in some, I'm, I'm sure we can find some modern stromatolites in France, but that would not be exotic for me. So we like to go to, you know, Mexico, Indonesia, uh, whatever. Nice countries outside, far away. Um, so those stromatolites uh, we looked at are from a lake in Mexico, and they are from a cr crater lake in Mexico. This is how they look like when they are a living stromatolite, green, because you have a film of bacteria at the top of it. And so you have the, the, these green, green microorganisms, photosynthesizing microorganisms. Now when, they, when the, the, the films of bacteria die, they look white like this. But you, you see there are a huge amount of, of stromatolites so, uh, outside of the water and within the lake. Like you can see some dark spots here. So this lake is pH 9. Uh, there is a huge amount of magnesium compared to the calcium. So this is quite unusual. Most of these stromatolites, they are composed of aragonite plus hydromagnesite. So aragonite is, cal is calcium carbonate and hydromagnesite is hydrated magnesium carbonate. So those things, they are aragonite plus hydromagnesite. The first thing we did was to study what microbes live in these stromatolites. For this, we used uh, uh, molecular biology. So basically, you can extract the DNA from uh, these samples. You extract the DNA, and then you have some processes that allows to amplify some specific genes that are called this way. So we, specify, we, we, we really sequence these genes that are some kind of identity genes. They tell you something about the species that are present in the sample. So eventually you end up with some sequences that you can compare. You build trees and these trees tell you something about the diversity of the microbes that live in these microbialites, or these stromatolites. And this is the result. These are some groups, or maybe uh, if you are not a microbiologist, this doesn't tell you much about uh, what these are. But these are different groups of bacteria and basically they are many groups. So everything you can find them in these stromatolites. There's a huge diversity, similar to what I've, seen, I've told you before. And uh, among this diversity, you have many groups that can induce precipitation of calcium carbonate. Okay, and even for the cyanobacteria, this is the tree with the sequences of cyanobacteria that, that we found in this uh, stromatolite. There are many species of cyanobacteria, many different species of cyanobacteria. You have six families, 33 different, let's say, let's call, it's not species, but let's call them species. So very huge diversity. Of course, the question is, how, how do you know who is doing the calcification in all that diversity? Should we get interested in one or two of them 
that are very important or should we consider them as a whole? But we don't know how to do that. Okay, so I skip that part. This is more characterization and some fossilization model. And I, I go to that one. Something that we did is that we were able to take these stromatolites, put them back, back to the lab. We put them in an aquarium, fill it with water, and let them for two, two years. And actually, we managed to maintain the diversity of the microbes living in this aquaria. So that's cool because we don't have to go to Mexico every, every two months or three months. So we have the samples in the laboratory. Then we started looking at the samples in the aquaria. And this is light microscopy. So you see, that's uh, just a mess. It's a big mass, big mass of microbes. We did some fluorescent microscopy. We see that there are many different things in that. But we got interested in those ones. So this, you see this rotate, this is light microscopy, rotate microbes. There are a few microns along. And you see some dark spots within the cells. And you see them on the light microscope images. So you see some, some spots, some dark spots. We image those cells by scanning electron microscopy. And this is a backscattered imaging, backscattered electron mode. So this is sensitive to the chemical composition. Those spots, those inclusions, they are very bright, which means that they, comp they are composed of heavy elements. These inclusions are mineral inclusions. So here we, have, we know that they are cyanobacteria because they, they have the size and they contain pigments like chlorophyll and things like that. So we know they are cyanobacteria and they form intracellular minerals. What are the uh, minerals? Okay, so that we, we know we can measure the fluorescent spectra on this, this bacteria and so that's how we know they are cyanobacteria. What are these inclusions? We can do TEM, transmission electron microscopy. This is the, the picture. We can do electron diffraction. Electron diffraction doesn't help because these <coughs> These uh, inclusions, they are amorphous, so we don't see much. Now, if we analyze by EDX, if we analyze the chemi chemical composition of this inclusion, they contain calcium, strontium, barium, and magnesium. So they contain calcium, barium, strontium, and magnesium, and they are poorly crystallized. If we want to go further, we can combine this with the STIXM, the scanning transmission X-ray microscopy, the synchrotron technique. Now, if we do this, we can measure the spectra at the carbon edge, the carbon key edge. The yellow spectrum comes from the cells, and you see how it looks like. The blue spectrum comes from the inclusion, and you see the spectrum. What is the difference between the two spectra? It's this peak here that we don't find here, but that we see here. So this is due to the mineral inclusion. And this is at 290.3 electron volts. And we know for sure 290.3 electron volts is the electron transition from the 1s orbital to the pi orbital in carbonates. So that means that the inclusions are carbonates. So these cyanobacteria, they form intracellular minerals that are composed of carbonates, calcium, strontium, barium, and magnesium. Now, if we move to another energy with the stixum, we move to just right above it. So this is the calcium. We are looking now at the chemistry of calcium. So this is the spectrum on the inclusions, and these are reference spectra of reference compounds. If you look at calcite, aragonite, strontianite, this is how the spectra looks like. And you see here, you have to look here, they don't look the same as, as at all with this one. Now, if we look at the spectrum of benstonite, benstonite is exactly the same. The same peaks at exactly the same position. Do you know benstonite? I used not to, I, I didn't know it uh, a <laughs> few, few months ago. Benstonite is this. Strontium, barium, magnesium, calcium carbonate. This is exactly what we have in these inclusions. So, Based on the environment of calcium in these inclusions, we conclude that we have poorly crystallized calcium, strontium, magnesium, carbonate formed by this cyanobacteria. 
Why is it important? And I, I'll stop with this. Uh, okay. Why is it important? First of all, here we see outside the cells, when you think about the stromatolites, they are composed, as I told you, of calcium carbonate, so aragonite and hydromagnesite. Now, if you go within the cells, you find calcium, strontium, barium, magnesium carbonate, benstonite. So somehow here, what we see is that they manage to control the chemical composition of the minerals they form within the cells. So far, we knew one other example of bacteria that were able to also control somehow the chemistry, but not only, but the chemistry of the crystals they form inside. These are the magnetotactic bacteria. Here, this is another example of intracellularly, intracellular biomineralization by bacteria, and we have no clue how they do it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that so far, as I, I mentioned you in the, in the introduction, people who wanted to find evidence for cyanobacteria, calcification of cyanobacteria in old rocks. You remember how they looked for it? They looked for cells encrusted in carbonates that the Giov Giovannella samples, because they thought so far, everybody was thinking that calcification by cyanobacteria, precipitation of calcium, uh, calcium carbonate was always extracellular. So you form calcium carbonate extracellularly and you entomb the cells within the rocks. And as I told you, we could not find such fossils in rocks older than 700, and 700 million years old. If you think now that some cyanobacteria can form minerals within the cells, those ones, they won't get encrusted by extracellular carbonates. They won't form fossils like, such as the one we were looking for. And the nice thing is that the cyanobacteria we have find, found are here. And here, that means that they are deeply branching in the tree of cyanobacteria. That means that they are somehow related directly to the ancestors of cyanobacteria. So let's put it that way. Maybe those, those guys here that form carbonates intracellularly, maybe they do exactly the same way as ancestral cyanobacteria did it. Maybe ancient cyanobacteria did not form extracellular carbonates, and so they, did, they could not get entombed into carbonate, and they could not form Giovanella-like fossils. Maybe ancient cyanobacteria formed only these intracellular carbonates, and we understand why we don't find fossils of cyanobacteria older than 700 million years old. So that could be, of course this is speculative, but this, this is one thing. So in that case, we need to reassess our models of how ancient cyanobacteria used to form carbonates and used to form stromatolites before they would not form carbonates outside the cells. Maybe they were forming carbonates within the cells and that changed everything of how we think about it. Okay, so that's my conclusion. Uh, you see that in my opinion, much is not understood on the formation of stromatolites. Um, what is the role of the microbial diversity? I've shown you only one or two types of cyanobacteria. There are many other microbes in these biofilms and we could look at, have a look at it. We don't know what is the importance of intracellular formation of carbonate versus the extracellular formation of carbonate. This of course affects completely our view of what we can retrieve from the study of ancient stromatolites. And finally, I hope I could show you that really studying this system at the nanoscale uh, provide us with some information, uh, with completely new information and first order information that we were not able to get at a lower magnification. So with this, I'd like um, to thank a few people. Uh, of course, the European Association of Geochemistry uh, and, 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 and the university, the, the, the Eod Vos Laurent University for hosting and organizing the, the, this whole talk. Um, I'd like to, to thank Mario for organizing the, the trip uh, in, to uh, Budapest, uh, Saba and, and Mihaili for uh, uh, 
preparing everything and, and hosting me here and welcoming me. That was a really nice uh, welcome. And all these people for uh, what they have been doing, uh, Estelle in particular, uh, Curado, who is a PhD student, she's finishing now. I think she should write, write up. She is right now in the process of writing the manuscript. I'm sure today she's doing it. So, okay. Um, and, and other people who have contributed uh, much to the science I've shown you. And I'd like to thank you all uh, for attending the, the talk and, and I'm welcome for, to, to your questions. The intracellular? Um, actually, right now, right now we don't know. Maybe, um, maybe they can get preserved in in the fossil records. But you, if you want to look for them, you have to look for tiny globules that maybe are enriched in barium and strontium. And not for, you see, you, you, you don't look for the cells because the cells will disappear and you will be only left with these inclusions. So you have to look for the inclusion. So far people have been looking for the cells because they thought that you have extracellular precipitation of carbonate. So the carbonate will precipitate around the cell and so you will preserve the cell. Here you don't preserve the cell, you preserve the intracellular. So you have just to look for something else. But maybe this, this can, maybe the traces of the, maybe this can be preserved in the geology. Definitely, definitely. I don't know. Uh, no, you are completely right. Maybe uh, when the cells degrade. Uh, maybe these globules won't be stable in the solution and so they will transform into another, another phase. In that case, you won't keep the trace of it. The thing is, of course, now people have to look for them. The problem is, as long as you don't look for them, there's no way you can find them, I think, because they are tiny. And, you know, you have to look at barium and strontium. It's not huge concentration. So, but definitely, maybe this is difficult to preserve. Sometimes it's amazing what you can preserve in the paleontological record, you know, that's so. all. Uh, yes, okay, uh, many questions. So the first one is, uh, I mean, it's uh, straightforward. Uh, do, you, I think, do I think that uh, ancient uh, stromatolites are, uh, are biogenic? Uh, I, I don't like much, I don't like uh, <laughs> answering this kind of question <laughs> because <laughs> If you say yes or no, you have uh, enemies on one part. Or, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you what I believe, but uh, what I know for a fact, 
Okay, let's say I think a majority of people think that they are biogenic, so I can say I, I believe they are biogenic. Um, then, to me, there are still these big questions. I, I still don't understand how you can connect a, mo a macroscopic morphology to the presence of microbes. Let's say if you f see a, ro a carbonate rocks that is like this with lamination, and you say, okay, that means there were some microbes. I don't see how you connect that. The, the day when we'll have a model explaining how you start with microbes and you end up with a micro macroscopic morphology like this, I'll be fine with this. But in my opinion, there is a missing link. I don't, I don't understand why we relate macroscopic morphology with microbes. So again, yeah, I think there are several arguments that are strong in saying that there was life around these structures. But I don't see how you can say stromatolites equal bacteria. And I'm sure that saying stromatolites equal cyanobacteria, I'm sure that this is really not strongly uh, you know, proved. So that's one for one. Um, the second question um, was about uh, this uh, clay. Uh, Carbonate, so there were carbonate and clays, mineral. Yeah, yeah, so there's uh, degradation. Uh, no. Okay. Okay, why do we have variation in the, in the phases? How do they form? Yeah, so, so that's also something I, I didn't talk about. Um, most of the time, uh, people, when they, 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 they talk about stromatolites, they uh, think about mar marine environments. Stromatolites is equal to mar marine environments. And that's big in the community. Um, what I can say for sure is that some ancient stromatolites, the one I showed you, for example, 2.7 billion years old, there have been a big debate, and I think now it's, 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 uh, it's clearer. Those stromatolites, they were not marine at all. They were formed in lakes, okay? So people usually think about marine, but sometimes it's lake. That's what we have been looking at, lake environment. And again, this is speculative, but I think we have many, many evidence for this. The way we think about, in, in these samples, for example, why do we have smectite? and then aragonite. These lakes, they are stratified. So in the summer, you have heat coming from the upper part. So you have warm water at the, at the surface, and you have cold water in the bottom. And so cold means heavier. So the, 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 the deep water stays deep. This, and so you have stratification like this. And the thing is that you have many reactions going on in the deep layers, in the deep water column. And so this water becomes anoxic. So we know that deep into these lakes, it's anoxic. Now, two, uh, it depends, one or twice a year, you have mixing of the water. It's winter, so you are, uh, so uh, the surface water gets colder so heavier, so it sinks, and you have the deep water coming up. And the stromatolites are sitting here at the surface. In the winter, during the mixing phase, they see the bottom water coming up, and the bottom water are anoxic. So the stromatolites now, they see this water coming up, and they see iron coming up, manganese coming up, silica-rich silica, silica, silica rich water. And in my opinion, these layers, they come, I mean, they might be explained this way. Here we have smectite, iron-rich smectite, which means iron-2-rich smectite. The only way I can explain this, and these are orthogenic phases, the only way I can explain this is that I have anoxic bottom water coming up. Okay, so I have anoxic, so this is mix, mixing of the water in the lake. 
And so in the ancient stromatolites, that could be a model also. So, and the, 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 the last uh, ask, uh, uh, question was about, so you form the stromatolites with the, the bacteria at the surface, but there are other bacteria living uh, beneath, and how much do they degrade this, uh, do they change or transform the stromatolites? Uh, this is clear, that there is some transformation. And this is actually one example. This thing that you see here, all these black dots, these are microbes. And what we could show is that these microbes are what we call endolithic microbes, bacteria. Endolithic means those microbes actually, they come from the surface and they dug into the stromatolites. They managed to dig into the carbonates and dig in many galleries. I mean, it's looked like, so they dissolve the carbonates and they live into in the holes that they create. So definitely, they, and, and then they precipitate, sometimes they precipitate new phases. So definitely, there are some microbes, for example, that are able to really excavate, dig into the samples, into the stromatolites, reprecipitate things, and completely transform the stromatolites. Of course, this is not everywhere, but sometimes it can represent a significant part of the stromatolites. Eventually, if you get this piece of rock in, let's say, let's pretend we can live uh, for one more billion years, okay? And we take this rock, we will find, maybe we'll find some remnants of cells in the stromatolites, but those, those filaments, they were not at the beginning. They were not there at the beginning. These were not the cyanobacteria that formed the stromatolite. These were strom uh, cyanobacteria that colonized secondarily the stromatolite. And this is also difficult, you know, in my opinion, to recognize in the geological record. How can you make the difference between those ones and the ones that were entrapped in the carbonates in the initial? Yes, I, I, don't, I don't know my, uh, many uh, cases uh, myself. I've never looked at uh, hot springs from atolites. Uh, I've been looking at some stromatolites or microbialites formed uh, at the bottom of uh, Lake Van, for example, where you have some, uh, some, seeps, uh, some seeping water coming from the, the, the bottom. We have observed exactly, th this is not from Lake Van, okay, but this is exactly the same thing. And so we see some alternation of aragonite and iron and manganese rich smectite or some phase like this. And sometimes we have also iron carbonate. My explanation, my best explanation for this is that the, there are pulses of when the, 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 the groundwater comes in. And so when this groundwater might be anoxic, rich in silica and iron and manganese, and when it comes in, you deposit these layers, and when it stops, you have the, the whole lake, the water of the lake that is uh, coming over, and, and you precipitate the aragonite. That's the best explanation I could get for, for example, one example, the, the, the Lake Van stuff, like you, this lamination refer to episode, uh, episodic uh, uh, pulses of different waters like but and so for the hot spring samples I don't know maybe uh, why not <laughs> but I've never looked at that 